It is now my privilege to welcome our speaker. Dr. Paul McPartland is currently the Carl J. Peter Professor of Systematic Theology and Ecumenism at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Father Paul holds a master's degree from the University of Cambridge, a licentiate from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, and a doctorate from the University of Oxford. Please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Paul McPartland. Christ is risen. Your eminences, dear fathers, dear brothers and sisters, it is a great honor, and I'm very conscious of that honor, in being invited to speak and to give this St. Cyril and St. Methodius lecture this evening. I'm delighted to be with you, and I thank uh, Father Petro very much for his kind invitation. The academic year is drawing to a close, and exams have taken place here, I know, hence the graduation this evening, and they're taking place this week at the Catholic University of America in Washington. It's a busy time for students and, of course, for faculty, but it also offers some lighter moments. When I was in Cambridge a few years ago, I met a friend who had been marking papers and he just decided to go out for a walk. You'll never guess what I've just read, he said. The immortal line. As Saint Augustine said in his famous work, A Tale of Two Cities, Well, it's two brothers that we're honoring this evening. In his encyclical letter, Slavorum Apostoli, on the Holy Brothers, Cyril and Methodius, back in 1985, Pope John Paul recalled that in 1980, he had named them as co-patrons of Europe. That act, he said, had been influenced by three factors in his own prayer and his own reflection. The third being the beginning, precisely in 1980, of the happy and promising theological dialogue between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox churches on the island of Patmos, as he recalled. It seems particularly appropriate, therefore, to speak under their holy patronage this evening about this crucial international dialogue, which after some years of difficulty resumed on the 18th of September last year in Belgrade, Serbia. I had the great joy of being present at that meeting. Just over two months later, as you know very well, Pope Benedict XVI made his eagerly awaited visit to Turkey, and in particular to the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople, where he was received with the greatest warmth by Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew. In going as soon as he could to Constantinople, Pope Benedict was following in the footsteps of his beloved predecessor. One of the first things that Pope John Paul II did after his election was to go in 1979 to Constantinople. He and Ecumenical Patriarch Demetrios announced their decision to start theological dialogue between their churches. And the Pope said that he hoped that full communion would be re-established between Catholics and Orthodox by the year 2000. The dialogue duly began in 1980 and flourished for 10 years or so until the massive changes in Eastern Europe following the fall of the Iron Curtain. The dialogue then got into serious difficulty particularly over the issue of Eastern Catholic churches, so-called uniatism. Nevertheless, three major agreed statements were achieved in that first decade. And in 1993, I gathered them into a book, which I called optimistically, One in 2000, 
a certain English Catholic bishop, who shall remain nameless, saw the book, saw that it was about Catholic Orthodox unity, and asked whether the title indicated a target date or the betting odds. <laughs> yes, the dialogue has been beset with problems. But thank God it has now resumed with an intense desire for progress. The co-chairman of the dialogue are Cardinal Walter Casper on the Catholic side and on the Orthodox side, Metropolitan John Zizulus of Pergamon, memorably described some years ago by Yves Congar as one of the most original and most profound theologians of our time. In October 2005, Metropolitan John was a fraternal delegate representing the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople at the Synod of Bishops held in Rome to consider the topic of the Eucharist, source and summit of the life and mission of the Church. He spoke warmly of the theme of the Synod, and I quote, we Orthodox, he said, are deeply gratified by the fact that your synod too regards the Eucharist as the source and summit of the life and mission of the church. It is extremely important that Roman Catholics and Orthodox can say this with one voice. He then went on, Eucharistic ecclesiology can guide us in our efforts to overcome 1,000 years of separation. For it is a pity to hold the same conviction on the importance of the Eucharist and not be able to share it at the same table. The ecclesiology of communion promoted by Vatican II, he went on, can make sense only if it derives from the Eucharistic life of the church. The Eucharist belongs not simply to the well-being, but to the being of the church. The whole life, word, and structure of the church is Eucharistic in its very essence. These are extremely important words. Identifying Eucharistic ecclesiology as the common theological matrix within which the issues that continue to divide Catholics and Orthodox can be constructively addressed. His final reference to the structure of the church being Eucharistic is particularly significant because theologically speaking, there is only one truly outstanding issue that needs to be resolved between Catholics and Orthodox and it is the structural issue of primacy in the church. Clearly, Metropolitan John wants a Eucharistic approach to all such issues. But is there a Eucharistic approach to primacy, we may well wonder? Well, that's certainly not been the customary approach to primacy among Catholics, but we shall see that Catholic theology has indeed been moving towards a Eucharistic understanding of primacy in recent decades, as Eucharistic ecclesiology has become ever more firmly established in Catholic doctrine. Two statements from the Catechism of the Catholic Church from 1992 may serve to summarize what Eucharistic ecclesiology is. First of all, the Catechism states with emphasis the key principle of Eucharistic ecclesiology, namely, and I quote, the Eucharist makes the church. And those words actually appear in italics in the Catechism. And secondly, the Catechism points out that this principle has structural consequences for the shape of the church, as we might say. The church, it says, is the people that God gathers in the whole world. She exists in local communities and is made real as a liturgical and, above all, a Eucharistic assembly. It's clear, then, 
that the Catholic Church espouses Eucharistic ecclesiology. And we should remember that the Catechism was written under the direction of Cardinal Ratzinger, whose ecclesiology has always been strongly Eucharistic. We might also very aptly recall the final encyclical letter of Pope John Paul, Ecclesia de Eucharistia, in 2003, the opening sentence, the church draws her life from the Eucharist. Now, there were already significant pointers towards a Eucharistic ecclesiology at Vatican II. The council taught that the Eucharistic sacrifice is, and I quote, the source and summit of the Christian life. It specified that the Eucharistic assembly of a local church presided over by the bishop with his clergy and people gathered around was the principal manifestation of the church. And it said of such local churches that it is in these and formed out of them that the one and unique Catholic Church exists. Indeed, it added, from one point of view, the mystical body of Christ can be understood as a corporate body of churches. Walter Casper has saluted those statements of the Council as reinstating perspectives that were lost around the start of the second millennium. At that time, he says, the Eucharistic ecclesiology of the early church fell into general oblivion in the wake of Eucharistic controversy, and the church began to be understood mainly as a single hierarchical structure. What the council taught, therefore, was quite momentous, and I quote from Walter Casper. The recourse to the first millennium and its communio ecclesiology means parting with the one-sided unity ecclesiology of the second millennium, which was and has been until today one of the essential reasons for the separation of the Eastern churches. The understanding of the unity of the church as a communio unity leaves space again for a legitimate multiplicity of local churches within the greater unity in the one faith, the same sacraments and offices. With that, he says, the road is smoothed for the church's way into the third millennium. The great exponent of the history of ecclesiology, Father Yves Congar, himself concluded that between the 11th and the 13th centuries, the West developed what he called an ecclesiology of the universal church, understood as, and I quote again, a single society under the apostolic monarchy of Peter, end of quote, which he says was foreign to the eastern part of the church. The east, he says, retained more of a communio vision. And of course, in due course, in the 20th century, it was a Russian Orthodox theologian, Nicholas Afanasyev, who actually coined the term Eucharistic ecclesiology and advocated the principle that where there is a Eucharistic assembly, there Christ abides, and there is the Church of God in Christ. Afanasyev was one of a group of Orthodox theologians who left Russia after the 1917 revolution and who subsequently exercised a strong influence on theology in the West. Many, including Afanasyev himself, settled in Paris, while others moved on here to the United States. Afanasyev had a remarkable influence on Vatican II and was actually present as an ecumenical observer during the final period of the council in 1965. One of the council's principal documents, Lumen Gentium, teaches in number 26 that the bishop is the prime celebrant of the Eucharist in his local church. And it says that it's the Eucharist 
from which the church ever derives its life and on which it thrives. That text was first introduced into the second draft of the schema De Ecclesia, which was to become Lumen Gentium in due course. It was introduced in 1963. The final text came out in 64. And there was an explanatory footnote when that sentence was introduced into the draft, which said this. If only the church makes the Eucharist, it is also true that the Eucharist makes the church. That statement bears the unmistakable hallmark of the great French Jesuit theologian Henri de Lubac, who said exactly the same in his Meditation sur l'Église in 1953. But de Lubac was not actually mentioned in attachment to that sentence. Instead, Augustine, Jerome, Leo the Great, and Thomas Aquinas were cited. And then the note rather strikingly concluded, regarding the link between ecclesiology and the Eucharist, it said, CF also Nicholas Afanasiev. Catholic bishops receiving the draft and wanting to deepen their knowledge of this topic were therefore referred to Augustine, Aquinas, and Afanasiev. It's clear that various sources were being used and drawn upon for the Eucharistic ecclesiology that was finding expression at the council. Afanasiev was by no means the sole influence. Nevertheless, he was an important influence, and his views acted as something of a catalyst for the council's teaching on the church. We can tell this from another footnote to the draft of De Ecclesia. The Eucharist is central to orthodox life, it says, and many orthodox theologians are following Afanasiev in setting up an opposition between a universalistic ecclesiology, in other words, one universal church hierarchically organized as espoused by the Catholic Church, and a Eucharistic ecclesiology, an ecclesiology of particular churches. Therefore, said the note strategically, it seems very useful to show in what way the Catholic Church itself starts from a Eucharistic ecclesiology, which at the same time is universalistic. The fundamental conviction being expressed there is that the very Eucharist which local churches celebrate itself requires that they be bound together in an overall unity. The Eucharist itself generates bonds of communion, not just within, but also between the communities which celebrate it. It can fairly be said that the one crucial theological issue confronting Catholic Orthodox dialogue today is that of identifying the structure of unity which properly corresponds to the mystery of the one Eucharist celebrated by local churches spread all round the world. It is within that context that the question of primacy needs to be resolved. Afanasiev believed that any juridical structure of unity was alien to Eucharistic ecclesiology. That position was unsatisfactory and rather provocative to the drafters of Lumen Gentium, as we just saw. Interestingly, it also proved unsatisfactory and provocative to some orthodox theologians in the generation following Afanasiev. Outstanding among them is John Zizoulas, a Eucharistic community that would close itself to others, he says, would betray the Catholic character of the Eucharist. On the other hand, he says, any overall structure of unity must respect the full Catholicity of each local church and not reduce local churches simply to parts of a whole as pre-Vatican II Catholic ecclesiology 
tended to. In other words, structure cannot be imposed simply for reasons of good order. That is universalism. On the contrary, structure must arise from the Eucharist and correspond to the Eucharist, and it must respect and release the Catholicity that the Eucharist gives to each local church. Afanasiev's emphasis upon the Eucharist, but extreme reaction against ecclesial structures, precipitated a searching critique of those structures that really do not have a Eucharistic justification, but arise from other, more worldly considerations. And it has ultimately led to the concerted effort nowadays in Catholic ecclesiology, in Orthodox ecclesiology, and perhaps most promisingly in Catholic Orthodox dialogue to identify those structures that the Eucharist itself truly generates and requires. The first statement of the International Catholic Orthodox Dialogue in 1982 made a bold statement about the practical implications of belief in the Trinity. And I quote, because the one and only God is the communion of three persons, the one and only church is a communion of many communities, and the local church a communion of persons. End of quote. The church is therefore an icon of the Trinity, and it is sustained in that identity and regulated by the Eucharist in which we receive communion. How significant that expression suddenly appears. The statement says that the Eucharist is the criterion for the functioning of the life of the church as a whole. The institutional elements, it says, should be nothing but a visible reflection of the reality of the mystery. End of quote. A decisive principle is being stated there, namely that properly ecclesial structures must have a Eucharistic rationale. At this point, we might note a rather similar principle at the heart of Pope Benedict's first encyclical letter, Deus Caritas Est, on the love of God. He stresses that the Eucharist is the celebration that anchors us in God's love, hence its ancient name of agape. Then, at the transition from the theoretical first part into the practical second part of the encyclical, the Pope says the entire activity of the church is an expression of a love that seeks the integral good of man. Love, he says, thus needs to be organized if it is to be an ordered service to the community. The church's structures must incarnate love. All this surely means that structures must relate intimately to the Eucharist. And it helps us to unpack that principle, which otherwise might sound perhaps a bit ideological or dogmatic. It helps us to unpack it in practical and compelling terms, Structures relate to the Eucharist because they relate to the love that the Eucharist above all communicates to us. Moreover, the Pope's one reference to his own office is made in terms of love. He reminds us that St. Ignatius of Antioch referred to the Church of Rome as presiding in charity, agape. So what of the papacy? that most thorny issue in Catholic Orthodox dialogue. In 1992, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith issued a letter on the idea of the church as communion. That letter set out a strongly Eucharistic ecclesiology and identified the need that such an ecclesiology has for a universal primacy, 
It spoke of the danger of seeing local churches as independent entities. And it said, it is precisely the Eucharist that renders all self-sufficiency impossible. The papacy has its place within the context of that necessary openness to one another of truly Eucharistic local churches. And I quote, the existence of the Petrine ministry bears a profound correspondence to the Eucharistic character of the church, end of quote. The Catechism of 1992, the same year, made the same point. The Pope, it said, is associated with every celebration of the Eucharist, wherein he is named as the sign and servant of the unity of the church. The fact that in major official Catholic texts such as these, the papacy is being set within the very framework of the mutual openness of local churches that Zizulus espouses, in accordance with a rigorously Eucharistic ecclesiology, is exciting and profoundly promising for progress between Catholics and Orthodox. What is also deeply encouraging is that Zizulus himself has been making a strong case in recent years for a universal primacy within Eucharistic ecclesiology. He has done this by emphasizing the necessary complementarity between primacy and synodality in the church. He thinks that many Orthodox mistakenly draw a contrast between how the Orthodox Church is governed by synods and how the Catholic Church is governed by the Pope. In Orthodox tradition, he says, there has never been and there can never be a synod or a council without a protos or a primus. If therefore synodality exists, jure divino, primacy must also exist by the same right. He proposes that a canon from the 4th century, namely the 34th Apostolic Canon, can provide what he calls the golden rule for the theology of primacy. The canon goes as follows. The bishops of every nation, ethnos, ought to know who is the first one, protos, among them, and to esteem him as their head, kephale, and not to do anything, any great thing, without his consent. But everyone to manage only the affairs that belong to his own diocese and the territory subject to it. But let him, i.e. the first one, not do anything without the consent of the other bishops. For it is by this means that there will be unanimity, and God will be glorified through Christ in the Holy Spirit. End of canon. Reflecting on the canon again recently, Metropolitan John highlighted that concluding reference to the Holy Trinity, which indicates, he says, that canonical provisions of this kind are not a matter of mere organization, but have a theological value. And he means theological there in the ultimate sense, a Trinitarian basis. In short, as he would say, using one of his very characteristic expressions, the one and the many go together in an ecclesiology truly rooted in the Trinity. And that pattern, the one and the many, applies at all levels of church organization, necessarily including the universal. Orthodox, he would say, have emphasized the many and need to rediscover the one, particularly in the form of a universal primate. Catholics, on the other hand, have emphasized the one and need to recover the many. Vatican II's teaching on Episcopal collegiality is therefore a big step in the right direction 
but more steps are needed. Clearly, Zizulus's proposal makes demands both of his fellow Orthodox and also of Catholics. I'll return to the demands of his fellow Orthodox in a moment. But let us just pursue the demands he makes of Catholics a little bit further. He makes a very specific and rather difficult request. He would like Catholics to recognize that a proper universal primacy need not necessarily involve universal jurisdiction. That is, he says, the right to intervene in local churches, because that, in his view, violates the full Catholicity of the local church. Is this an impasse? Well, not necessarily. Let's acknowledge that the medieval West, in and after the Gregorian reform in the late 11th century, did allow jurisdiction to detach itself, so to speak, from the sacramental life of the church, and particularly from the Eucharist, so as to form a somewhat independent mechanism of church unity. As Yves Congar, once again, has frankly shown, it was then that the idea of universal jurisdiction, and indeed of the Pope as universal bishop, came to the fore. Joseph Ratzinger himself has spoken of the separation of the doctrine of the Eucharist and ecclesiology, which can be noted from the 11th and 12th centuries onwards as one of the most unfortunate pages of medieval theology. Sacrament and jurisdiction, liturgy and administration, he says, were increasingly and harmfully distinguished. Clearly, an important move towards responding to Zizulus's proposal would be to reforge the link between liturgy and administration, between Eucharist and jurisdiction, Happily, as we saw earlier, there is plenty of evidence that the Catholic Church, in its recent commitment and a strong commitment to Eucharistic ecclesiology, has at least begun to embrace that task. What then of the demands Zizulus makes of his fellow Orthodox? Here we must note some tensions that have recently found expression, especially in statements of bishops of the Russian Orthodox Church. In a frank and thoughtful presentation to the Theological Commission of the Swiss, bishops, uh, the Swiss Roman Catholic Bishops' Conference in Basel in 2005, Bishop Hilarion of Vienna and Austria who represents the Patriarchate of Moscow on the International Dialogue, said that the question of primacy within the church had not been solved even within orthodoxy itself. A fact, he said, which makes the discussion of this subject between orthodox and Catholics significantly more difficult. And I quote, all the orthodox agree, he says, that in the Orthodox Church there is no single head on a worldwide scale, no single supreme high priest. However, the Orthodox disagree in their understanding of the primacy and role of the Patriarch of Constantinople. It is evident that a serious and responsible discussion of the theme of primacy at an inter-Orthodox level must precede theological discussion of this topic between Catholics and Orthodox. Otherwise, the Orthodox will not be able to express a unified point of view, which would inevitably bring the dialogue to a dead end." End of quote. Then speaking in November last year, after the plenary meeting of the dialogue in Belgrade, Bishop Hilarion said that he predicted many years of exhaustive and difficult work ahead especially regarding universal primacy. Complications will arise, he said, not only because of the very different understanding of primacy between the Catholic and Orthodox traditions, 
but also from the fact that there is no unanimous understanding of universal primacy among the Orthodox themselves. Just two weeks ago, in Rome, to represent the Ecumenical Patriarch at the 80th birthday celebrations of Pope Benedict, Metropolitan John Zizioulas spoke firmly and positively in an interview with La Repubblica newspaper. The crucial matter facing the international dialogue, he said, is the primacy of the Bishop of Rome, i.e. the role of the Pope. For some, he said, this is an insoluble problem. I, however, he said, maintain that a solution can be found. It's a matter of defining well the position of the Bishop of Rome in the structure of the Universal Church. The Orthodox, he said, are ready to accept the idea of a universal primate. And according to the canons of the early church, the Bishop of Rome is the primus. End of quote. Turning to the question of universal jurisdiction, the issue that we've already noted, he said, disagreement shows itself with regard to a fundamental problem. Can the Bishop of Rome interfere in local churches? Metropolitan John expressed his own view as follows. There can be no interference without a decision taken in common with the other bishops. It is a universal primacy which acts always in communion with the synod. End of quote. Then turning to the position of the Russian Orthodox, he said this. I'm afraid that in Moscow, they are not ready to accept a universal primacy of the Bishop of Rome. On the other hand, he said, they don't want to recognize the primacy of the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople. Within two days, Bishop Mark of Egoryevsk, deputy chairman of the Department for External Church Relations at the Moscow Patriarchate reiterated, the primacy of the Bishop of Rome, he said, is not on the agenda of any Orthodox Church. Clearly, this is a matter of great delicacy, and we must pray earnestly for the Holy Spirit's guidance as the churches seek the way forward. One of the great forerunners of this dialogue Father Yves Congar, knew its complexities very well. Back in 1952, he coined an image that is now very familiar. He said this, It's not in vain that the Christian world has always contained an East and a West from the beginning. This is an indispensable feature of its providential character. Theology, he said, is only fully Catholic when, like a healthy organism, it breathes deeply and uses both its lungs. 1952. Some years later, he expanded on that thought. Between East and Catholic West, he said, everything is similar, and yet all is different. East and West have two constructions of the Christian mystery, which cannot necessarily be superimposed. He quoted what the scientist Niels Bohr said in a very different context, words I think worth recalling when we encounter seemingly opposed positions. The opposite of a true statement is a false statement, but the opposite of a profound truth can be another profound truth. Catholic Orthodox dialogue, focused on the mystery of the Eucharist, has already borne great fruit. It would not be too much of a caricature, I would say, to imagine that Western Catholics and Western Christians in general have often thought of the Eucharist as the occasion when I, as an individual, encounter Christ in a reenactment of the past event of the Last Supper, a solemn memorial of his passion and death. That rather limited perception of the Eucharist, which I wouldn't dream of attributing to Eastern Catholics, has been steadily expanded in recent times into a much fuller vision 
by three complementary considerations. The Eucharist is the occasion when the church, in the power of the Spirit, anticipates the coming of the future kingdom and the everlasting celebration of the paschal victory of Christ over death. In short, then, a full understanding of the Eucharist involves not just I, but the church. Not just Christ, but also the Spirit. Not just the past, but also the future. Those three complementary dimensions, not just of the Eucharist, but of the whole Christian mystery, are amply represented in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and they are also strongly present in the first three Catholic Orthodox agreed statements. The Catechism was produced in 1992, after the fruitful first decade of international Catholic Orthodox dialogue, and it is tempting to think that the richness of the Catechism, which draws amply on sources both Western and Eastern, owes at least something providentially to the dialogue. Statements of the dialogue regarding the pneumatological and eschatological dimensions of the Eucharist certainly indicate ways in which the dialogue invites us to stretch our minds and our hearts into a fuller understanding of the mysteries we celebrate here are just a couple of little examples. First, regarding the link of the Eucharist with the Spirit, the first agreed statement says, the Spirit transforms the sacred gifts into the body and blood of Christ in order to bring about the growth of the body which is the church. In this sense, the entire celebration is an epiclesis, which becomes more explicit at certain moments. The church is continually in a state of epiclesis. Then regarding the link between the Eucharist and the future, the statement says this, the church existing in a given place is not formed in a radical sense by the persons who come together to establish it. There is a Jerusalem from on high which comes down from God a communion which is the foundation of the community itself. The church comes into being by a free gift, that of the new creation. I'd like to close by indicating another essential dimension of the Eucharist, already touched on in that quotation just a moment ago namely the link of the Eucharist with the salvation of creation as a whole. The Catechism teaches that in the Eucharist, and I quote, the whole of creation loved by God is presented to the Father through the death and resurrection of Christ. But that can hardly be said to be an aspect of the Eucharist that is vivid for Western Catholics at least. For Orthodox theology, however, it is crucial. The Eucharist is the restoration of humanity to its proper relationship both with God and with creation, and the restoration of the whole of the cosmos to its proper activity of praise. Metropolitan John is a leading figure in this area also. Man is priest of creation, he says. And man has to become a liturgical being before he can hope to overcome his ecological crisis, giving thanks to God for what has been entrusted to him instead of just exploiting it for his own short-term benefit. The schism between East and West occurred, he says, at a time when Western theology was starting to neglect the cosmic aspect of the Christian faith and of the Eucharist in particular. If that connection is accurate, it would follow that a recovery of the cosmic aspect of the Eucharist and of the gospel is vital for Catholic Orthodox rapprochement. It was the requirement of an effective mission to humanity 
that inspired ecumenical efforts through much of the 20th century in accordance with Jesus' prayer, Father, may they be one so that the world may believe. It may be that now, at the start of the 21st century, it is the urgency of an effective mission not just to humanity, but to creation itself that can focus and strengthen our ecumenical inspirations and energies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Father Paul, for your stimulating, exciting, thought-provoking presentation. We're all enriched by what you've given us this evening. And now, Dr. McParkland will take questions from the audience. It's a pleasure to be here with you. My question is, could you comment on what does it mean in this Orthodox Catholic dialogue that Pope Benedict, so I'm told, I removed the title Patriarch of the West from his series of titles as Pope. Thank you. The, this, of course, is a very, um, in some sense, a rather enigmatic development of recent times. Um, as you know, in the Annuario Pontificio, uh, the, the, the papal yearbook, there is a listing of many titles of the Pope, um, Bishop of Rome, of course, is the essential one, but then Primate of Italy, Supreme Pontiff, Vicar of Christ, and one of them, until recent times, has been Patriarch of the West. Uh, this title was recently removed, and everybody suddenly thought, it's not there anymore, what's happened? And looked around, because th there had been no official announcement that this was going to happen, and really no official explanation of why it was going to happen, and shortly afterwards, the uh, Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity produced a short statement which uh, indicated that this might perhaps be a help towards ecumenism, removing this title. And I think people even so remain slightly puzzled because an exhaustive account of this uh, has not really been given, and there are Many very scholarly studies, very uh, uh, lengthy studies of this title, uh, when it came in, what it means, what it doesn't mean, and I wouldn't claim to know all the ins and outs of this title myself. A couple of things that I would just say, and I, and I do freely admit that this is not an exhaustive explanation, because I would say an exhaustive explanation has not been given rather tantalizingly. Um, for some of the Orthodox, this certainly seemed to be a negative move because they thought that Patriarch of the West was a title that they could somehow latch on to. This was, this, was this was an avenue of approaching the papacy because, after all, some years ago, Cardinal Ratzinger himself made what many thought a very helpful distinction between two officers of the Pope, that he is universal primate, yes, but he is Patriarch, sorry, he is Patriarch of the West, and people were thinking of the Pentarchy and the, the idea of, of different patriarchates and of the Patriarchate of Rome, I suppose you would want to say, if you were really fitting into that pattern, not Patriarch of the West. But anyway, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger himself said some years ago that since the schism between East and West, 1054, between Orthodox and Catholic, the only area within which the Pope has been recognized as primate is the very area within which he was already patriarch, and therefore, since 1054, for nigh on a thousand years, these two titles have got completely jumbled up, and nobody any, any longer knows precisely which out of all the things the Pope does, he does as universal primate, and which he does as patriarch of the West. And he said it's essential to distinguish these two because the only uh, 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 capacity in which Catholics would want to offer the Pope to the Orthodox is as universal primate. They have their own patriarchs. 
And therefore, we need to distinguish what is it that the Pope does as patriarch, which obviously we would not want the Orthodox to think was part of the package, so to speak. And certainly as part of that, you would think, well, the naming of bishops is surely much more a patriarchal thing than a primatial thing. And therefore, Orthodox need to be reassured that in talking about universal primacy, Catholics don't have it in their minds that we, we'd like you to, to enter into communion with the Pope, who, by the way, will appoint all your bishops. You can imagine the reaction to that. So the sifting out of these two would seem to be a very useful thing. And therefore, once again, it becomes rather, rather enigmatic that this title has been taken away, um, obviously by the will of the Pope himself, because uh, such titles do not vanish from the Annuario Pontificio unless the Pope wants them to. What I would say also, which I think does begin to cast uh, some uh, light in a very helpful way on this, perhaps. I was told, and again, as I say, I'm not by any means an expert in this, and, uh, and I, I do want to stress that, that if you were to go back in history, that title, Patriarch of the West, in fact is not used in the Annuario, in the Annuario, as a title that's always been claimed by the popes. As I said, strictly speaking, if you were going to get into a sort of Pentarchy model, you'd say Patriarch of Rome, not Patriarch of the West. It seems a bit more curious. I believe, though I would have to check this, that the actual title, Patriarch of the West, in fact is a rather recent insertion into the Annuario Pontificio. That in fact it was an insertion, so I'm told, in, in the late 19th century, the time of Vatican I. It's part and parcel of the, of the Vatican I vision of the papacy. It's part of that agenda. Now, if that is so, then indeed it might seem very uh, helpful to remove a title which perhaps has a, uh, uh, perhaps a, an extra sort of Vatican I spin on it, Vatican I being the council which I suppose Orthodox would have the most difficulty with, uh, universal primacy and infallibility. And therefore I can see that if indeed the title has not always been in the Annuario, but in fact is a rather recent insertion, then its removal of it might indeed be the reassertion of an older state of affairs, perhaps less clear, you might say, but also perhaps less polemical, if we understand why that title got in in the first place. So it seems to me, in the absence of the sharper the, uh, details of the facts and, and analysis that I would dearly like to have, and I would dearly like us to, to, to be given, um, that it could indeed be what the Pontifical Council said at the time it was, which is a possible help towards an understanding between East and West, taking that title out. Well, Eminence. His Eminence is saying that uh, the Holy Father has recently said that in order to, to, to understand the, the original relationships in the church and indeed the relationship between Rome and Constantinople, that we need to return to the first 100 years of the church's life. The first 100 years would take us, of course, before the founding of Constantinople <laughs> and, and therefore would make us think of some fundamental principles of just the foundation of the church. And if, indeed, if you look at there we would be straight into a Eucharistic ecclesiology, of course, which makes me think that perhaps that is what he's saying. In other words, if, in a sense, prescinding from the history, but just trying to get back to, the, to the, the scriptural theology, if you like, of the understanding of the local community and the Eucharist that gives it life. And indeed, also in the first century, of course, of the bonds of charity and generosity between the local churches which we see very much in the, in the, in the collections taken for you know, the local churches in need. And I think also give us an indication of um, why it is that um, one of the features of, of, of Metropolitan John's, is Ulysses, approach to primacy is really to prescind both from uh, the scriptures and also from history. It's very interesting because he says, you know, if we start, as, as people often do when you're thinking of primacy, with a, a biblical study of the office of Peter or something like that, he says, 
you know, people never agree on these things. And he's, yeah, I remember one particular line. If we wait for the biblical scholars to, to reach a consensus on the role of Peter in the New Testament, that'll be putting off unity for another millennium or perhaps even longer, he said, you know. But likewise, he also says, very interestingly, um, we must prescind also from what would be the lessons of history. And this is an interesting gloss on what I was just saying about, you know, looking back to the first millennium and, and, and uh, you know, the role of primate and patriarch and perhaps trying to get into that. Because Zizula says, but there was disagreement even in the first millennium as to what the relative positions and prerogatives of the different seas was. And likewise, by extension, then, you could say, well, there are, there are undoubtedly different interpretations today of, for instance, what that title Third Rome means in Moscow. And so, you know, you think, well, can we ever reach clarity on these historical interpretations? And Zizulus once again says, we probably never will if we go down that road. And that's why I think what he wants to offer is this, in a sense, beautifully pure theological argument, which is uh, taken from that ancient canon, canon 34, which simply says, think of God who is three persons and yet anchored in one. The Father is the source of the Trinity, from whom the Son is begotten, from whom the Spirit proceeds. So three persons, yes, but anchored in one. The Trinity has a definite focal point. There are no Son and Spirit without the, the Father, but equally there's no Father without the Son and the Spirit. So a perfect mutuality there. And he says, if we are talking about a communion ecclesiology, that's the blueprint, that's the prototype. And therefore, rippling throughout all of the life and structure of the church in all of its different dimensions and all of its different levels, there should be that pattern, that configuration, the one and the many with perfect mutuality. And he says, you know, if we, if we have that at the local level, in the, in the diocese, the bishop and his people, we have it in a region with the, the, the patriarch, the primus and the synod. And he says, and it is absolutely logical and consistent to say that must also exist at the universal level. And so, in a sense, it is a, it is a beautifully simple and yet profound uh, principle that he, that he urges can be, as he says, the golden rule. Well, I have a question, but just a thought. The main document I remember reading about the first hundred years would have been Ref referring to the Pope would have been Ignatius's letters, and in there he calls the, po the Bishop of Rome presider in love or something like that, president the in church, love. The Church of Rome, which presides in love, yeah. yes. But also all his other titles came after the first hundred years. Oh, yes, yes. My other question is, is it, though it's very convenient to, to see the primacy of Rome as the main obstacle between Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy, if that issue could be overcome, let's say theoretically it could be overcome, okay, it seems to me that there are so many other lesser but important issues that divide orthodox sacramental life, orthodox theology from Roman Catholic theology. I think just one that comes to mind is a different approach of how is the sacrament of marriage affected? Was, is it the vow of the couple or is it the blessing of the priest, what do you think would happen? Well, thank you very much for, for, for you know, making us aware of that whole spectrum of what we must honestly uh, acknowledge as, uh, as differences in, in the practice and theology of the different parts of the church. I mean, you are absolutely right. And in fact, the particular example you give is, of course, a very fascinating one, the different approaches to marriage um, East and West, and the, the orthodox approach to marriage is often, um, I think, looked to rather <laughs> um, longingly by uh, Western uh, canon lawyers who, who think that uh, the reasoning the, the, of the Eastern uh, discipline with regard to tragic matters of divorce uh, has a sort of um, an appeal for dealing with some very difficult pastoral circumstances. And, and I know that many in the West are very interested in the, in the Eastern rationale because clearly when 
uh, when the Orthodox Church does something, it, it, everything it does is from deep roots, and therefore it's not something that can just be dismissed as, you know, or just, uh, just for convenience or just, uh, you know, a, a rather superficial thing that's just done for, for utilitarian reasons. No, this is done for profound reasons and therefore merits respect as a discipline and, and it has its own coherence. Likewise, the West's approach has its own coherence. And I think what we need to say when we look at two very different approaches, both of which have their own coherence, is to say, is this simply part of the richness of God and his ways amongst human beings with all their creativity and freedom and the marvelous variety that's intrinsic to human life? Or is it something absolutely so so critical that it ought to be in the the ecumenical phrase church dividing you know because there are many many differences between Christians but very very few which deserve to be church dividing and we've made an awful lot of things that aren't really worth being church dividing church dividing why probably because there's a divisive spirit in our hearts and we just want to latch on to an excuse. Oh, well, you don't do such and such. All oh, right, well, we do. You're different, aren't you? Yes, well, hmm. And, you know, uh, this, this is original sin, for goodness sake. This is original sin. Communion in God, Father, Son, and Spirit could not be more different, and yet could not be more one. We mustn't think that unity means uniformity. It's the fallen Adam in us which wants to take difference from others as a pretext for being divided from others. When we embrace the communion life of God, we rejoice in the difference of others, unless that difference is so profound and critical that it really is a difference that indicates a major otherness that is irreconcilable. Eve Congar, I think, gave us the, the way to cope with uh, otherness when he said that he marveled at the way the Western synthesis goes and the way the Eastern synthesis goes and realized that, in fact, you couldn't just, as it were, put the two together like two pieces of a jigsaw or just mix them together and then have a, a richer whole. There's no mixing can take place here, he said. It's a, it's a most strange togetherness of difference. Hence his idea that uh, the two lungs, his idea that here are two constructions of the Christian faith. Are they so radically different that they ought to be different churches? He would say, I'm sure, absolutely not. And we mustn't fear difference. We must learn to appreciate the other as an enrichment of what I have to, to say and to offer. And the Trinity can guide us on that. So I think when we encounter all these differences, we need to ask very seriously for, for each of them, is this so serious it merits dividing the church? And I think the instant answer that comes when the question's put like that with most of these differences is certainly not. We appreciate one another and ought to be one church with precisely those differences embraced by appreciation, love, respect, an understanding. Father, uh, I'm curious, in this model of uh, Eucharistic ecclesiology, which you talked about, where exactly do the Eastern Catholic churches fit within that model? Do they operate as separate churches, or must they be reintegrated into the Orthodox Church? Sorry, where, where, where exactly do... Where, where do the Eastern Catholic churches fit within this model of uh, Eucharistic ecclesiology that you have, have spoken about tonight. Do, do the Eastern churches stay as separate churches in communion with Rome, or do they, uh, must they become Orthodox? I think that's a further question beyond the, the, the realm of Eucharistic ecclesiology itself. I mean, what Eucharistic ecclesiology, I think, fundamentally requires of us is uh, an understanding that the Eucharist makes the church, that in every Eucharist we receive the very gift of our togetherness. We don't, we don't carry this ourselves through history. It is God's constant gift to us, a constant miracle of his love. So those who would celebrate Eucharist as 
The church understands it ought to be celebrated, namely presided over by a bishop in apostolic succession, and that applies, of course, to Roman Catholic, Eastern, uh, Eastern Catholic, to Orthodox. I mean, there's absolutely no question about the validity of orders amongst any of those churches, and hence about the validity of Eucharist amongst any of those churches. This is wonderful common ground between us. And what we then say is to realize, as, as I was mentioning in, in my paper, that if we are all receiving that gift from the one God, then this gift, in a sense, which binds us together, must also open up all of our doors, open up all of our windows to the other communities receiving the self-same gift. And therefore, this very gift, by its power, takes us out of ourselves, not only to the community with which we're celebrating, but takes our community out of itself into unity with all other such communities. So this, this celebration generates bonds of communion urgently and makes any, any church which is in any sense hampered by historical divisions, we might say, uh, deeply impatient of those divisions and deeply yearning for bonds with all the other communities that celebrate that selfsame uh, uh, mystery of the Eucharist. And so it draws all Catholic churches, Western and Eastern, and the Orthodox churches, into the profound search for the right bonds of communion between them. And so I think then that becomes the, the, the serious question. What are the right bonds of communion between us? Thank you once again, Father Paul, for your wonderful lecture, and also for the additional enlightening responses to the various questions. Thank you for your attention and your attendance. I thank you for your participation. Christ is risen. Indeed.